Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt I right. Right. And I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Collider, where true personal stories about science help us to discover how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today's stories are so fun because they give us the -the behind-the-scenes insight into why some people do what they do. A peek behind the curtain, if you will. Because sometimes the reason people do their job or keep trying at something despite the obstacles in the way is not something as obvious as because it's fun or it makes a lot of money. Sometimes it can be something much more deep and meaningful, or something completely random, like our first storyteller, Paul Byrne. Paul is an associate professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. His story was recorded at the Public Media Commons in St. Louis as part of the St. Louis Astronomy Festival. His story is such a great reminder that even when you're stuck in the drudgery of day-to-day life, there's still a whole great big world out there, and sometimes you need to remember to look at the bigger picture. It's such a great story, and you're going to love Paul and his delightful Irish accent. Here's Paul. I'm going to bring you back to 2011, which I don't know about you, but that feels like 50 years ago at this point. Uh, So like you heard, like Ken described, I was a newly minted postdoctoral fellow at the Carnegie Institution of Science in Washington, D.C. Now, at the time, I had finished my undergrad and my Ph.D. I was a newly minted doctor, uh, in hindsight, an idiot. But at the time, feeling like I was well equipped to do this kind of space stuff. And I was extremely lucky to work on NASA's messenger mission. It was the first mission ever to orbit Mercury. Now, the reason that's a big deal is because Mercury is really hard to get to. And in fact, although we'd only gone to Mercury one time before, back in the 70s, that spacecraft only saw half of the planet, which meant that until the messenger spacecraft, which was launched in 2004 and took seven years to get to Mercury, and I'll talk about why in a moment, we didn't know what half the planet looked like. So one of my jobs as a newly minted young postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie was to every day look at the images that were coming down from the spacecraft from all the way at Mercury. And what was incredible about that experience was that every day we were seeing parts of the solar system that no human had ever seen before. And we were seeing landscapes that we didn't know what to expect. And, and that, was, that was a humbling experience. But there was also a kind of a sense of routine to it. And so after a few months of, you know, looking at these images, I got to tell you, Mercury is a really interesting place. But after a while, it starts to kind of look the same. There are craters, and then there are bigger craters. And sometimes there are really big craters. And then there's a lot of other stuff in between, which actually turns out it's really small craters if you look in. So it's pretty cratered. Now, it's it's a good world. It's, It's not, you know, it doesn't get the kind of love that, say, Mars does, because most people actually haven't even seen Mercury. It usually only goes a few degrees over the horizon. So unless you're in a field, it's really hard to see Mercury, which is kind of the reason why we didn't explore it all that much. So we were looking through these images, and I was paging through pages of these archival images that the spacecraft had taken, and one jumped out at me, and it was a picture of the Galapagos Islands. Now, you may wonder... How is a spacecraft going to Mercury have a picture of the Galapagos? Like, that's some pretty bad navigational error. (laughs) 
it turns out that it actually takes a long time to get to Mercury for a good reason. The analogy I like to use is this. Imagine you're on the top of a skyscraper and you're looking down at the street and you see your best friend and you want to say something to them. Now, you have two options for getting to your friend. One is very fast, <laughs> but you won't really be in much of a position to have a conversation with them. And the other is slower, but it's safer. Well, it turns out that if you go straight to Mercury from Earth, you can get there in a few months, but you're going to make a little crater. Or maybe you'll fly right past Mercury into the sun. So the way you get to Mercury with a small spacecraft, the messenger spacecraft was the size of a large office desk. It was tiny. The way you get there with a small spacecraft is you do all these gravitational flybys. And you slowly spiral into the deepest part of the solar system. And doing so, by flying past other worlds, you get slow and slow enough until eventually when you reach Mercury, you're able to get into orbit. And so the Messenger mission launched in 2004 flew a year later back to Earth for a gravitational assist. And then it went on and did two flybys of Venus. And then it did three flybys of Mercury. And on the fourth approach to Mercury, it was finally going slow enough that its little engine was enough to slow it down just enough to make orbit. And, and I can relate to the idea of hoping you have a job if the mission works. <laughs> And it actually made orbit in St. Patrick's Day, 2011. And I stayed up watching the NASA live stream going, I don't know if I need to pack my bags or not, because this thing could make a crater or it could go into orbit. And you know what? The, the engineers in that spacecraft, they missed their perfect orbit by like two kilometers. Now, you know how far away Mercury is. That's pretty good. So anyway, I'm looking through these images and I see this picture of the Galapagos. And it's, an, it's a beautiful image. There's the, the islands and they're in the middle of the Pacific and the sun is shining, this glint. And it just, it's just stopped me in my tracks. This amazing image. And I was like, this is something that I don't see every day. And at that moment, I realized the reason it, it was so arresting to me was because it just hit me. Remember, I'm looking at craters all the time. And there's a lot of craters on Mercury. And suddenly I see this picture and I realize modern humans have been around for 100, 150,000 years. We've been looking through telescopes for about 400 years. And we've been sending robotic spacecraft out into the solar system for about 50 years. So for the tiniest segment of our species history, have we been in the position where we can see photos from the surfaces of other worlds? And it just struck me that this part in our, in our species history is essentially unparalleled. And even up until a few decades ago, astronomers had the exclusive domain of planetary science because you needed telescopes to see these worlds. And it was in the 60s we began to send stuff out into space and see these images. And so looking at this image, I was like, you know, this is insane. Two or three generations ago, there was no capacity for building a rocket in the first place. And now we're photographing the, the surfaces of other worlds. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that if you think of it like I do, the hope is that in a few generations' time, maybe it won't be so unusual to see the surfaces of other worlds because humans will have spread out into the solar system tentatively at first, but eventually, hopefully, in large numbers. Which means this is this very narrow window in time when we're beginning to take these first steps out into the solar system. And I was like, that's really cool. And then I went back to look at craters. <laughs> and for... for for months, you know, we, we were doing some cool stuff. We saw these weird lava channels on Venus or on Mercury. I got to name stuff uh, past the International Astronomical Union. I didn't tell them that the inspiration for the naming was Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it was. <laughs> but we got to do some really cool stuff. But that picture of the Galapagos kind of stuck with me. And I, you know, I kept coming back to it. And I didn't really understand why. And it was about a year later when I realized why it had had such an effect on me. And it wasn't just that I was like, oh, uh, I get to go and look at these cool images and boast to my friends. And I tell all my friends about my work. They don't care about them, but I tell them. <laughs> but the reason this image really stuck with me is because in the years up to that point and the years since, both in my own career and in the work we do as a species, sending spacecraft out to the outer solar system, there's not a single place we've been to not a single world we've surveyed that looks remotely like our own. And what I realized about that picture of the Galapagos was that there is, for the foreseeable future, no prospect that we will photograph a world that has liquid water oceans and sunlight glinting on it and an island where Darwin found observations that helped him craft his idea of evolution. That image tells us just how rare and special and vulnerable this world is, because we now know there's nothing like it anywhere nearby. 
I believe that there are worlds like Earth orbiting other stars, but we don't know about them yet. And we are a very long way from having the technology to be able to photograph them and look for their islands glinting in their suns. And it really just brought home to me the idea that a thing I learned later was called the overview effect. This idea was originally developed or, or came to prominence during the Apollo missions, when astronauts would fly from Earth and for the first time in human history, look out through a single window and see the entire planet floating in the dark. And these astronauts would come back and they would, tell, they would talk about this overview effect, this sort of change, this shift of perspective, where suddenly you realize all the stuff that we squabble about on the ground doesn't really seem all that important. It's really hard to see borders from space. Now, I have not been into space yet. <laughs> but with this image, I think I had my own little insight into this idea, this overview effect. And it has helped me realize since, and I use this in a lot of my public outreach talks and even in my lectures, I help people understand these pictures aren't just about telling us about the details of a given world or all the processes that might shape planets generally and what they have in common. More than anything, it's giving us a perspective we cannot possibly have otherwise to get a sense of just how vulnerable our world is. And at a time when we are arguably facing the greatest challenge of our species so far, anthropogenic climate change, it really, really helps to get that perspective of that little blue world out there in the dark, sunlight glinting on its oceans, the only place like it we know. And that perspective might just help all of us to take a little more care and collaborate a little bit more here on Earth, as we look to see what's out there. Thank you very much. That was Paul. To learn more about him, visit our website, storycollider.org. Being a storyteller on our stage is just one way to make Story Collider happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, Maybe becoming a Story Collider donor might be more your speed. Story Collider donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story Collider is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power these stories have and this mission, please donate to the Story Collider at storycollider.org slash donate. The most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storycollider.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Collider. Our next story is from storyteller David Estrada. David is an associate professor in the Material Science and Engineering Department at Boise State University. His story was recorded in Boise as part of a special show we did in partnership with Boise State University and the Center for Advanced Energy Studies, featuring personal stories from veterans and service members in STEM. It was an incredible night, and David's story is equally incredible. His story really shows that there's no set path to success or making a difference in the world. I can't wait for you to hear this story. Here's David. Uh, I'm the youngest of six children. I was born to uh, Mexican immigrants. My father, uh, he never completed high school. My mother did not complete high school. In my father's case, uh, about the age of seven, second grade, he had to drop out of elementary school so that he could be um, the sole provider for his family. He had eight siblings, and so he's in a single mother household trying to support the family. It's a very difficult task, as you can imagine, for somebody in second grade. And he lost two of his brothers to starvation, a fact that he didn't share with me until I was an adult just several years ago. Right? Can you imagine the guilt uh, that he must have felt his whole life. My mother was slightly better off, um, but she too was raised in a single mother household. Um, she made it through elementary school, and junior high and in high school. She had to drop out because at that time and in, in that school, you had to pay for your chemistry lab fees and they couldn't afford it. So she also did not complete her high school education. This motivated my parents to move to the United States to seek greater opportunities for their children. And they brought my two oldest sisters with them and immigrated to Marcin and worked in the orchards there around 1970s. Um, so you can imagine now that not having completed high school, either of them, uh, education was very much valued in our family. Um, and I felt this growing up uh, with my siblings. And I can remember, you know, the 
the times I would work with my my mother as a young child and uh, doing homework at, at the kitchen table. And, you know, I didn't realize at the time my dad couldn't help me, but she really enjoyed it. And she really enjoyed the math and science and um, really encouraged me to study hard and, and complete our education as long as my siblings. Uh, and, you know, fast forward a couple of years, time goes on and my siblings, we all grow up and we start to graduate from high school one by one. And siblings start to move out of the house and start their careers and start their families. And so I became the last of my family to graduate from Nampa High School in 1995. And this marks a major milestone for my parents because they had seen all six children complete the high school education that they did not have the opportunity uh, to do. But in my case, I was still had that value of education and wanted to continue my education into college. And, uh, so this motivated me to seek resources to continue down that path. And of course, the military is one of those that can provide college fund GI Bill and opportunities for education. So I enlisted in the US Navy as the electronics warfare technician. And this allowed me to sign up for six years. My first two years, I'd be getting an advanced electronics uh, training. Uh, that's the equivalent of an associate's degree in electronics technology. Uh, the rest of my time was spent overseas in Yokosuka, Japan, serving on board the Arleigh Bird class uh, destroyer, the USS Curtis Wilbur. Now, many experiences uh, stand out from my time in the Navy, right? I, I remember, uh, you know, my first mission or that I was serving on, I had to meet my ship out of Bahrain to do uh, sanctions enforcement on Iraq. And this is when Saddam was still in charge over there. Uh, and so that was long nights getting kind of just thrown into the mission as, as a newly minted E4. I remember 9-11. Uh, and I think many of you might, might also remember when those towers fell and the military was called to action. And I went upstairs and packed my sea bag because I knew that call was coming and we had to go to the ship. You know, I remember simple simple things too, day-to-day -day operations and uh, underway replenishments were kind of my favorite underway activity, but also like a blessing in disguise. You got to be outside on the forecastle, feeling the sea spray in your face and the fresh air. And But, you know, we worked at least 13 hours a day on watch and another six hours uh, on top of that. So underway replenishment basically meant no sleep for 24 hours for me. But still, I got to be outside and you could smell that diesel getting pumped from the big oiler. You could see the, the crates coming over full of food and steaks that had been rejected by Kansas State Prison. <laughs> but the one experience that stands out the most to me, and I think is the most transformative uh, on my career, was a visit to the tiny island of East Timor. And this was around 2000, shortly after they had just suffered a, a civil war. And the Curtis Wilbur had been charged with going to support a humanitarian mission there under the United Nations. And, um, so we went there and anchored out and I was uh, selected to be part of the landing party that would go and help rebuild a couple elementary schools in part because of the advanced electronics training that I had received. And so we went to shore on the rib boat and I, I remember getting off the rib boat and getting on, on, you know, it's hot, it's humid. And you step onto the pier and there's the U.S. Marine Corps and the United Nations soldiers with their baby blue berets ready to escort us uh, to go go do the work at the elementary school. We go through town, right, and on the way to the school and there's just these ditches next to the road. And what's that smell? Well, it turns out the sewage system in, in the city after their civil war, it's basically an open network of ditches that just ran alongside the city street. And you can see the flies <laughs> going from the ditch to the meat hanging in the open air market. And you say, wow, this is a breeding ground for cholera, dysentery, hepatitis, you name it, right? This is disgusting. And very first time I'd seen this, this level of poverty in, in these kind of conditions. So we continue on and we go to the elementary school and we're coming and the elementary school has a large concrete wall around it. We're walking by and there's the bullet holes, right? All still in the outer schoolhouse walls, serving as a sickening reminder of the political violence that had surrounded these kids' lives just months before we'd arrived, right? And so we come around the corner and, and there's the school children and they were happy and they were eager to see us, knowing that we were there to help rebuild their educational environment. While in the background, there's sewage overflowing from the latrine. There's no fresh water in the school. 
there's not a place to get a, you know, there's no cafeteria. You're not going to get your chicken nuggets and fries, right? And <laughs> there's no place for a hot meal. It's just, but they, they were excited. They were excited for that education to, uh, opportunity to pursue their education. And so when I was in East Timor, I saw despair. Right? I saw this poverty, but I also saw hope. And it's the first time in my life that I realized that for many people around the globe, they are willing to take great personal risk for the opportunity to pursue their education. Some people even become combat engineers <laughs> to pursue a civil engineering education. <laughs> and so this also reminded me, just seeing this level of poverty and, and, and about my own uh, ancestors and my parents and how they grew up in lesser conditions and had to give up their opportunities to pursue an education. So this motivated me to actually factor it into my decision to separate from the Navy. Because I was no longer content with just serving my country and using my technical skills in, in service of my nation. I wanted to do something more and use my skills to help solve problems which have no regard for political, socioeconomic, or cultural boundaries. And so I came back after 2004, I received my honorable discharge and came back home to Idaho uh, to pursue my undergraduate education here at Boise State and uh, bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering. And during that time, I kind of, uh, you know, we uh, were pursuing the education. I had gotten married in Japan with uh, my wife and our son was born uh, shortly after here in Boise, Idaho. Um, and I started to get involved in research through the McNair Scholars Program and got the bug to pursue an advanced degree and, and career in research. And so that led to uh, pursuing a PhD at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, also in electrical engineering with a degree in uh, uh, emphasis in semiconductor device physics. Right? And so I was the first in my family to get the college degree in 2004. My wife and I were the first in our families to get advanced degrees as well. Um, she has her master's, I have my PhD. And, we came, both, we came back here in 2013, both as faculty at Boise State University. And I remember being very excited at that time. And, um, you know, when I got in my office, right, there's David Estrada, PhD on my door, and my lab is across the hall, right? And I'm in the new environmental research building, which my brother helped build, by the way, right? And by then, he'd established himself as one of the best Mason's laborers in, in, the, uh, in the region. And those of you who don't know, these are the guys that mix the concrete and the mortar, pack the bricks, pack the block, build the scaffold, drive the forklifts, right? And so I got to have my lab in a building that my brother built. And it was empty, it was clean, and you know somebody must have cleaned it before we showed up. Um, <laughs> and, and walk in, it's just ready, right? It's ready for new instruments. It's ready for students who are eager to learn and work on impactful problems. And so that was 10 years ago. Now my team is uh, the Advanced Nanomaterials and Manufacturing Lab. We occupy, I think, about eight labs here in Boise and two labs in Idaho Falls, right? And uh, also, you know, we're here in the new Micron Center for Materials Research, uh, also another building that my brother helped build. But we have a mission in our lab, and that's to develop uh, manufacturing and material solutions for grand challenges which have no regard for political, socioeconomic, or cultural boundaries. We, we want to tackle those big problems. Now, this next part of the story I have to take a little care in because you're not supposed to have favorite projects as a faculty member, right? And they're kind of, you can't have your, your favorite child. Some of my students are in the audience. <laughs> but so I, one, one project that I'm particularly excited to work on, right? Um, I love them all. Uh, but this one uh, was very exciting because it's a new area uh, of research for me, and I believe it has a lot of impact. And um, it's, uh, you know, faculty members still like to learn alongside their students, right? And so I got into water research. And, um, you know, you might be thinking water, right? You know, at least one person appreciates the importance of, and, and the difficulty and the technical aspects of water. I'm sure there's others here, but. Uh, it's a kind of an easy problem to motivate, but also here it can be kind of difficult to motivate, right? You might think about your own day this morning, right? What did, you know, raise your hand if you brush your teeth this morning. Oh boy, who's not raising their hand? Take a quick look, right? <laughs> so you get up, you can go to your faucet, you turn it on, there's your fresh water, brush your teeth, wash your face. Maybe you go downstairs, right? Next thing you do is put water on the teapot, drink the coffee, and 
you just make yourself a nice cup of coffee or tea with, with the fresh water. You Maybe you uh, did the dishes after breakfast, right? You rinse them off, put them in that magic box that's on a timer, and just fresh water comes later and cleans it. Um, and maybe you left a couple gallons of water for your pets right, in, the, in the dish bowl and you head out the door. Right? That's not the case for a lot of people around the world. And I didn't understand this until I got an a email. Uh, I probably still don't understand the full scope, but I got an email from a woman in Pakistan, uh, Naksh Mansur. And she had emailed me probably about five, six years ago and wanted to come to Boise and Boise State to work on using nanomaterials um, to do water remediation right? and, and help treat water and, and remove contaminants from water. And she was on a Fulbright Fellowship, so being the, uh, on the tenure track and needing free students, I was like, great, I'm going to learn water. Come on, we're going <laughs> to publish some papers and I'm going to get tenure. But it was also you know, an important problem to work on. You see, in Noxia's hometown, Water doesn't come out, you know, that easily out of the faucet and, and the city system, right? The trucks have to deliver the water, and the trucks deliver the water to a big tank on the on the roof, and you don't get more, you know, if you use all that, you got to wait till the next truck shows up. So you have to be very conservative, and in, in using that water. And this is a luxury, right? This is a luxury for people who can afford to pay the truck to fill that water tank. I have another student uh, who just started with our group about a year ago. And I was talking to him on a uh, you know, trip to go get a cup of Starbucks and uh, found out that uh, Felix uh, used to walk five miles a day to bring a couple gallons of fresh water home to, to his family, right? And uh, Felix is from Nigeria. So, you know, I, I think water is one of these big problems, right, that can transcend these political, socioeconomic, cultural boundaries. And it's a big problem around the world. Happy to say we're making progress and developing technologies to, to work in this area. Last year, uh, Nox and I published a paper together where we used a new class of materials known as maxines uh, to remove ammonia from simulated uh, agricultural waste streams. Right? Maxines are about three to five atoms thick, about the diameter of your DNA. And the, the flakes were about 500 nanometers in lateral dimension, so about 100 times smaller than the diameter of your hair. And these materials, we put them in a capacitive deionization cell. You put a voltage on them, and you can pull ions out of water. And they are operating at 10 times greater energy efficiency um, and 100 times more ion absorption capacity than state-of-the-art activated carbon and CDI, so that, that material that's in your broader, Brita water filter. Felix has an interesting problem. Uh, he's part of a new National Science Foundation program, $6 million program we have with Louisiana Tech and some other schools in the southeast to develop inks to print cheap water quality sensors, right? And so working with Felix is fun and trying to teach him all about graphene, this uh, wonder material that's one carbon atom thick, right? And he's trying to develop an ink that can print these sensors using an inkjet printer, something like that you might have in your home office, right? So we can do distributed water quality monitoring. Can you imagine just you know in your one of these remote villages or, or you know in a remote area, just being able to put a sheet of paper in print your water quality sensor, see what contaminants are, are there, and then maybe combine it with Notch's work to remove those contaminants. It's, it's quite exciting, and I never imagined, right, that I would be in this position uh, to, to do this kind of work with my students. And it, it, you know, it just reminds me of taking that rib boat back and leaving the shores of East Timor and going back to the, the Curtis Wilbur, that beautiful haze gray ship. Let's say it sarcastically. Uh, climb up the ladder right, and get on the fan, the fan tail right, where the helicopters land. And I remember at that time thinking, you know, as I'm watching the sunset, and the, if you've never seen the Indonesian sunsets, they're amazing. Um, pretty much every color in the sky. And thinking to myself, I want to go back and, and do something more and to work on impactful problems. And that's part of being a faculty member um, is offering, you know, having uh, the opportunity to provide other students the chance to pursue their education. Uh, but more than that, just the journey I've taken and, and my own education and uh, the opportunities that have come, up, come from that, I always think that education is a great equalizer, right? If you have the opportunity, it can, it can help level the playing field, and more so for the next generation to come, right? And so, you know, the opportunities that my son has in his education 
to, uh, he's not even, there's no question he's going to graduate high school, right? Or, or even what college, uh, I go to college. He doesn't ask, should I go to college? It's like, which college will I go to? Um, but that's his story, and that's something for him to tell. But I could tell you this, it's off to an amazing start. Thank you. That was David. If you'd like to learn more about him, visit our website, storycollider.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Collider, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use them all. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storycollider.org to become a financial supporter, or if you want to come to one of our shows, start your own Story Collider show in your community, or even learn how to tell your own science story, you can learn all about that on our website, too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jen Chen, and Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Collider. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Sam Lyons, Gabe Montesanti, Nikisha Roberts-Washington, and Jatesh Jaggi. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Bernson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost, and next week, I'll be back with those rare stories where life has a surprising full-circle moment. They're so good, and I can't wait for you to listen to them. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.